This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 282, recorded on February 16th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, good to see you all. From Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. From St. Louis, Missouri, Petra Levin. Hello, it's great to be here. And returning for the nth time, where N <laughs> indicates twim adjacent from the University of Puget Sound, Mark Martin. Hello, Mark. It's good to be here, Vincent. How's, how's the weather in uh, Tacoma? Funny you would ask. 38 degrees Fahrenheit, 3 degrees C. We had a light dusting of snow just a couple of days ago. I love it. It's okay. February. Yeah, it is February. Here, uh, it is unseasonably warm. Mm. Yeah, Charleston has Chamber of Commerce weather, 74 degrees and sunny. <laughs> it is it is February. We'll get cold again. All right. Let's dive right into our science. Really interesting stuff as usual. Nothing unique. And we will start with a snippet from Michelle. Yes, and this was recommended by our twin partner, Mark Martin. <laughs> the title is Caffeine Tolerant Mutations Selected Through an At-Home Yeast Experimental Evolution Teaching Lab. And it is a currently available open access as a preprint on BioArchive. And it is from, the authors are um, Naomi Morrissey, Renee Geck, Ryan Scopehammer, Dennis Godin, the YIVO students, Bryce Taylor, and Maitreya Dunham from the Genome Sciences Group at University of Washington in Seattle, the Westridge School in Pasadena, which is a K through t- or a fourth, fourth through 12 grade school, and then the um, program in biology at Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa. And it's an ongoing collaboration between um, colleagues at University of Washington and the Westridge School. And it is inspired by uh, what is called curriculum-based undergraduate research experiences, which were um, proposed and championed by a interdisciplinary group that launched the project back in 2007 that produced a paper titled Vision and Change in Undergraduate Biology, A Call to Action. So this was led by the NSF, and they collaborated with um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the NIH, and um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They held a conference and brought like-minded thought leaders in this field to really think hard about how we needed to adapt our teaching style with a mission to transform biology classrooms across the country to reflect the biology that scientists are doing in the 21st century. So they um, had a conference, they had issued a report in 2011, and then um, this publication that I've linked to in the show notes. And they promote, for example, some core concepts that they think all biology instruction at the high school level should teach. And they include, for example, evolution, how information flows in cells and in organisms, and also systems that the the interconnections between um, all living things. And they also emphasize some core competencies. For example, students should learn in high school how to apply the scientific process, apply quantitative reasoning, and also to get experience communicating and collaborating across multiple disciplines. So I think this project that we'll describe really does that um, beautifully. So it's it's active learning, and it really built on um, some earlier work that um, applied the wonderful organism uh, baker's yeast to as as a model system it's this is something that is in our food already it's in bread and and wine and beer for example as well as other foods but it's also been studied for a very long time so we have a lot of uh, terrific tools and a large literature for it and they also recognize that for a experimental system to be able to go out of the Um, high school and into people's homes, they needed to come up with um, safe 
reagents, if you will, a kit that they could um, have at each other person's home. So they uh, decided to focus on caffeine. And this was a great choice because caffeine is safe. It's already in um, some of our favorite foods. <laughs> And also, um, it ha- there's a precedent in the literature that you can identify mutants, variants of yeast that are more tolerant of um, caffeine. And there's some information then on some components, cellular components, signal transduction systems that um, are contribute to this uh, tolerance of caffeine. So what they did is um, had 28 students who each got this kit with some Fleshman's Baker's yeast. So you probably have seen this in the grocery store or used it yourself. I love that they used the Fleshman's yeast. It's yeah. so great. <laughs> Although some earlier papers from collaborations from these groups used a Red Star yeast, which mm. will also work. <laughs> should, should fairness, um, they should use both. Yeah, so what they did is uh, give each student a culture of the yeast in uh, a rich media. Although they used a trick, they um, dropped the pH of the media below what we would typically use in the lab so that they could discourage random contamination because the students, of course, Kill are going to be... Kill off the bacteria. Yeah, <laughs> try to hold a, other things off. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had the students transfer yeast after it had grown in this in the first uh, tube of media to increasing concentrations of caffeine over a period of eight weeks. So it keep um, increasing the uh, stress, the caffeine stress. And then at the end of this eight weeks, they had the students send in their cultures to the University of Washington, where their uh, genomic sciences division was um, able to, with funding from the NSF, I believe, was able to do whole genome sequencing on each of the isolates. And even before that, of course, they isolated single colonies. Let's just have a look at what um, came out of these uh, 28 students' um, home experiments. And the first thing they saw was uh, really uh, wonderful, which was um, the longer they passaged the strains, the more variation they saw in the appearance of the colonies. So their starting strain had a um, really (laughs) um, wrinkled uh, morphology, and you can see this in figure 1B. But with time, they picked up um, colony variants that were smooth and then others that were um, what they call petite. So this is a classic term in, um, in yeast biology when the bacteria or when the microbial cells lose their mitochondrial DNA, their mitochondria, they form smaller colonies. So that's um, illustrated for us here. And then through the whole genome sequencing, they could begin to understand what the impact on the genome was of this increasing uh, exposure or exposure to increasing concentrations of of caffeine. And what they saw was um, really beautiful illustration of the many types of genetic variation that can occur. Some of the variants gained chromosomes. Some of them lost entire chromosomes. Mm-hmm. Uh, one or two, perhaps, had an insertion mutation. So this is an old favorite, um, the TY element, which is what part of my graduate thesis work uh, involved. <laughs> a, T- a TY element had inserted into a particular gene, which was exciting because the gene that it um, had inserted into was had previously been described as linked to tolerance of or stress caused by caffeine. And then they had another um, group of strains. 13 that had, um, or actually a large number of strains, also had um, mutations on the chromosome. So uh, individual mutations that were, would change the coding sequence, for example. And while a number of these um, were in genes that had previously been associated in yeast with um, resistance to caffeine, and this is shown in um, figure 1D, a number of genes that are known to be involved in transcription, so making RNA or translation, turning the RNA into protein, also transport of different molecules, um, some genes there, and then others uh, that affect the cytoskeleton. And a number of these, again, in the literature had already been um, associated with um, yeast tolerance of uh, caffeine. But what was also exciting, I'm sure, is that a number of the strains, I think 13, had um, missense mutations in uh, genes that had not been uh, previously um, associated. 
So this is a potential then that they have not only kind of verified that their methods were working as expected, but also they may have um, discovered some new loci that contribute to this uh, response. And of course, there's more work um, that would need to be done, not in students' homes during the pandemic, <laughs> but rather in uh, molecular genetics labs. And actually, by publishing this work, um, they're making this information freely available so other people in the field um, can take their candidate genes and investigate them in more detail. So I thought this was uh, really ingenious, um, and it is, again, building off of earlier work that some of these people had contributed to, looking at uh, resistance of yeast to household cleaners was one project that's been published in Jimby. And then another project, they looked for um, yeast mutants that were resistant to um, antifungals. So, for example, if you've had you or a child you know has had diaper rash or athlete's foot, you can buy over-the-counter counter antifungals. So another paper um, that was uh, published by this group isolated mutants of yeast um, that were more resistant to um, these antifungals, which of course has um, clinical significance as well because we don't have a large number of ways to treat fungal infections. So I thought this was a really clever approach, and I'm sure it was an engaging experience for those college students. What do you all think? Have you ever been taught um, high school biology this way? What do you think, Mark? So uh, I actually was fortunate enough to be up at UW for lunch with Matreya. Uh, cool. Shout out to Matreya Dunham. And I heard about all of this, and I have been waiting to see it come out, which is why I shot it your way. And uh, it is just wonderful. And I have to say, folks that are at R01 institutions are so used to having a lot of equipment and a lot of access and at, at, our, at, at PUIs, like I'm at, we don't have those things. So there's a PUI, lot of- PUI, primarily toward... undergrad institution. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. Not, not PUIs, right? Exactly. <laughs> a- anyway, what I was, what I was going to say is, is that most of us are now doing the equivalent of this sort of thing because just the exercises that we do over and over with students doesn't really engage them. To have them find out something that wasn't known before is a very big deal so far. You know, for example, in my own classes, which I'm teaching now to first years, we isolate the microbes from their water bottles and we do 16S to figure out what they are. And then we're part of meaning a a, a sequencing method of 16S RNA. Exactly so. The essentially the the prokaryotic barcode. And, uh, and then at the same time, we're part of uh, Joe Handelsman's Tiny Earth program looking for antibiotic producers. And so, a lot of people, I mean, Seth Bordenstein does this with Discover the Microbes Within, with Wolbachia. There's sea phages. There are all these wonderful opportunities. During the pandemic, it was really tough to do any of that. And that's where Matreya's work really impressed me. She could have a little brown bag with what they needed to do the work. Yeah. Now, I have questions like, if you're transferring without a shaker, are you not selecting for particular things by doing so? And you are. Uh, but that's not necessarily a problem. And to their credit, the authors uh, mentioned that. They they did mm-hmm. um, kind of enrich for strains that formed more clumps or flocculent. Yeah. Um, and they thought, well, that might be related to the phenotype of interest, but it could also be just the physical transfer of strains from one tube to another. And it really doesn't matter because they're finding out things that they did that were of interest. Yeah. And I put in the show notes Von Cooper's Evolving STEM program, which this reminds me a lot of. And I won't take up any time. I know we're short on time, but it is just a lovely approach that has many similarities. Although it's in bacteria, and you can use a bioinformatics program called Patrick to find out precisely what genes have changed. And I have done this with students in my own classes. And the look on their faces when I say, well, you know, this is an unknown gene you found is really cool. remarkable. Oh, yeah. So I think this is uh, the way a lot of people are being pushed. I will say, w- this is a different bit of a program because this is not tremendously expensive, but a lot of the cures can be pricey. So, but I think it's well worth it. Yeah, and I have included a link in the show notes to the um, Yeast Evolution Authentic Research Experience for high school students. They um, have available to anybody who wants to engage um, a lot of information on the website, including how to contact them and, and become involved. Yeah, it's really nice to see this because, you know, 
even at my institution, which we have a large undergraduate major numbers, we're trying to adapt our labs so that most of them are project-based, inquiry-based, which is more along these lines. And the difference in what the students, I think, get out of those labs in terms of thinking and critical analysis skills, it's amazing. Some of the stuff they produce is very impressive, and and they are identifying new things in those project-based labs. And one of the things that has not been brought up yet is the figure that they are offering to present the data are very compelling and they're very easy to digest based <laughs> on their color selection, based on their layout, and even the simplicity uh, or clarity, I should say, not simple. The clarity of their legend really helps the reader know what's actually going on. Yeah. So what is this journal, Micro Publications? So right now, it's just a, um, it, it is a um, preprint on BioArchive. So. I wasn't able to learn more about the journal. Have you heard of it, Mark? I have. And and I know that it's just a way of getting things out quickly. Mm-hmm. And I do know that Matreya and her co and her coworkers really want to get this stuff out before. And you know, onto onto uh, like perhaps Jimby or something similar. And and I really, really, really wish that they would, uh, because this is good stuff. Can you guys tell us what Jimby is? Oh, I'm sorry. The journal of Microbiology and biology, and, and biology education. education. Thank you. It's an it's ASM an ASM journal. Yes, yep. it is. Cool, very cool. So, Mark, you would do this with your students, you think? I have done very similar things. Um, any, and, and I love the idea, and I make a joke of this all the time. I I tell students, and I even have a cartoon of this, that the hand of Darwin is on all that lives. And if you think <laughs> about it. What you're doing is you're letting, you know, I, I tell the students, you know, you're used to the idea of natural selection. Well, this is Michelle, this is Michelle selection or something similar. And, and that's something I'll talk about when, when it comes to the paper as well. But, uh, absolutely, I have done things just like this. I, and the look on their faces when they find a gene no one's seen before. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's not that important, right? Because sometimes you can get multiple changes, but it's a good way to slide in a little bit of bioinformatics into design. Uh, for example, you could easily ask the question, I'm going to start with a bacterium that can swim in motility auger, and I'm going to select for ones that are faster and faster and slower and slower. And then for about $80 each, if you have a reference genome, you can get a quick read to find out what has changed from the reference genome. And the program that we've been using, which is, of course, not developed by me, good Lord, look at these hands, um, is called Patrick. And what it does is it just compares the reads to the reference genome. And you find new stuff all the time. Yeah. So I, I think it's really applicable to a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I, I want to end by just giving a shout out to the um, uh, faculty at the at Loras College in Dubuque, Iowa, who contributed to this earlier work um, by Bennett et al. at Elmhurst University, in Illinois, and then also, of course, the uh, Westridge School high schoolers and their teachers that contributed. Thank you, Michelle. Now uh, on to Mark for our paper. So I want to apologize in advance for how excited I'm going to be. <laughs> never, <laughs> never. <laughs> you may or may not know that I've spent many years trying to do work with Della Vibrio, so that's a really big deal to me. And there's a background behind that because my first microbiology professor way back at UCLA was Sid Rittenberg, who did a lot of work with this strain of Della Vibrio, with which I'm quite familiar. But what I love about this paper is I talk a lot about biofilms with students and the fact that there are emergent properties when biofilms form. And this is graphical, visual evidence of exactly that, which Could is wonderful. Could you tell us emergent properties in, in Absol- high school absolutely. biology terms? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Sodium metal is is explosive and deadly and will burn you. Chlorine gas will kill you dead. You mix them together and you have something to put on your popcorn. And you never would have guessed that. (laughs) Got it. Right? (laughs) And and so sometimes uh I I well, anyway, I won't talk about teaching. That's that's a little bit much. But this is actually a, a wonderful paper, but I have to say that I have a personal connection to a lot of this, not in terms of of the work that's done, 
But in terms of my own expertise and what I've studied for a number of years, as I mentioned, my original microbiology professor, Sid Rittenberg, used to work on it. I was very interested in Della Vibrio's ability to chew up biofilms of E. coli. And I well remember being unable to replicate data on this many, many years ago and writing very sadly to George O'Toole about this. And then he says, yeah, we worked on that. And he published a paper on it. So he had all kinds of equipment and ideas and, and resources that I didn't. I did know that Della Vibrio would just decimate E. coli biofilms, which was fascinating to me. But it's so wonderful to see how much farther it's been taken by Dan Kuduri, who's been working with Della Vibrio for many, many years. The kind of the precis of the paper is, I would say, is interaction. Did we get the title and the authorship? I'm getting, I'm getting oh, to okay. it right now. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I would, I would say basically, I would call this interactions between two prey bacterial species and a bacterial predator. But the title that they use, which is the same thing is Breakdown of Clonal Cooperative Architecture in Multi-Species Biofilms and the Spatial Ecology of Predation. And the authors are Wuckner, Winnens, Isaid, Kaduri, and Nadell. And they are from, well, Joan Strassman suggested this, wonderful. They are at Dartmouth. And it was a wonderful thing. I really like the way the paper is put together. You can get lost in the images. But what I like so much about this is that it's very clear in what's going on. And I'd like to just give a quick introduction for people who aren't familiar with Della Vibrio, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's like my paramour that is, is like sometimes with me and sometimes not. Della Vibrio can be very frustrating to work with, and it's always fun to see people be successful. Discovered in 1964 by Stolp and Mortimer Starr, um, it's a gram-negative ne- gram delta proteobacter. It's about a quarter of the size of E. coli. It can swim at literally 50 cell lengths per second, consumes many different types of gram-negative bacteria, It appears to live within what I used to call the periplasmic space. It is not a space. It is full of solutes. It is the periplasm. And it has a two-phase life cycle, uh, attack phase where it's out there hunting, and then one where they're living within the periplasm at the expense of the host cell. And so you call it attack phase and intraperiplasmic phase. And there are different types of genes associated at different um, steps of the process. Liz Socket has done a lot of wonderful work at Nottingham, breaking this down. Jerkovich in, in Israel, again, a, a wonderful person has done a lot of it. It's a relatively small area of people working with this. And they are obligate parasites, right? They can only reproduce yes. when they're inside another gram negative. Is that correct? That's exactly right, Petra. I'm so glad you say that. And, and I want to tell you a little bit about how they do a culture. It'll just take a moment. You grow up, for example, E. coli. You resuspend it in buffer with no nutrients, and you have this thick suspension. You add yourself a small dilution of your Della Vibrio culture, Della Vibrio meaning curved leech, by the way, and then after three days, it clears because they're so much smaller than E. coli, they diffract light differently. Hmm. Hmm. And Neat. it is the bane. Not as well. <laughs> yeah. Not as well or if at all. Yeah, and 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 because they're really teeny, My microscope is relatively useless with it. So I actually put some stuff up that you can see on the show notes from other people who have wonderful, wonderful equipment. But Petra hit on something very important that I want to emphasize. And I'm going to try not to to give my basic prejudice on this, on this field a little bit. I I pretty much see every paper about Della Vibrio comes across my desk and ask me to review it because I'm, I, I treat everybody nicely. Apparently, this is not super common, but I like everybody doing this work. <laughs> and I'm just being honest, all right? But I will say that I didn't see this one. And that's okay, because I was so excited, which is why I recommended it. But um, attack phase Della Vibrio, intraperiplasmic phase. You can get mutants, Petra, that can grow on media. And you will find people that will tell you that they're facultative and can grow on prey cells and then also grow on media. But I have never found that to be true. They're all messed up. And in fact, it isn't one or two mutations necessary to have them grow. It comes back to evolution again. Um, They can be finicky. 
uh, which is important. Did, th- did that help, Petra? Yes. No, that helped a lot. And also just imagining how you culture them is much more obvious. I've never actually yeah. heard a description of that. They are amazing little guys. They are. And I'll come back to that in a moment because it's wonderful. Um, so one of the things I just want everyone to know is the people first discover Della Vibrio, they'll say, oh, I'm going to make a um, Della, Vib- Della Vibrio resistant E. coli, and then I'll know what the receptor is. Because nobody knows, Petra. They really don't. And you can get things resistant to Della Vibrio, and then you retest them, and they're sensitive. And we don't know why. No one knows why. Uh, we we know a lot about how it gets into prey cells. We really do. And that has to do primarily with using type 4 a pili to shoehorn into that 40 nanometer space between the inner and the outer membranes. Fascinating. And then they alter the cell membrane behind them so further Della Vibrios can't get in, which is just wonderful. So a lot of people will have developed, and this would be um, Jerkovich and Socket, uh, have developed certain genetic systems that be done that Tom uh, Thomasow. Uh, and even Ned Ruby early on developed some very simple ways to do genetic analysis in Della Vibrio, which is not easy to do at all, but very rewarding. But the final thing before I start on to this is that evolution is taking place all the time. And we're going to come back to that in just a, just a little bit at the end. I'm watching the time, Vincent. Don't be upset with me. So the first thing that I want to say that is really obvious to all of us, and it is not obvious to non-microbiologists, is how integral biofilms are to everything. I have a whole lecture about the heresies of microbiology, and I misquote John Don, and I say that, as he wrote, that no man is an island, no single cell by itself usually exists. They're existing in conglomerations and generally on surfaces that we call biofilms. And you get different architecture of these biofilms based on the media, on how they settle, a number of different things. And it's important to know that a large percentage of bacterial diseases that uh, from bacteria that cause diseases in humans uh, are due to biofilms, which is interesting. So, And in fact, Mark, the CDC and the NIH put that number at approximately 80% of all the infectious diseases mm-hmm. are biofilm derived. And they're hard to treat. They're hard to treat because we're going to see that, yeah, you can't, well, as as Mark describes the architecture of these communities, um, it's hard to get antibiotics in there. All right. So this is what's interesting here. The players are E. coli, Vibrio cholera, and Della Vibrio bacteria voris. Now, there are two strains of Della Vibrio being used nowadays. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. The strain that they're using that I spent several years working on is called 109J. The one that most people have moved to is called HD100. I'll come back to how they're different later. I should also say that all of these initial strains of Della Vibrio that Stolp and Starr originally isolated were isolated on Pseudomonas putida from the soil which most people don't know, but it grows fine in E. coli. I, I think that's so, actually an important point, right? That Delos don't have any preference as long as it's gram negative. Is that the only preference that oh, they have? Oh, but Petra, they do have they preferences. They do have preferences. But it's really hard to measure that because of the way that we study it. And that's why I love about this paper. Exactly. So <laughs> this is very different than – this would be like studying phages at very low MOIs. And and I'm sorry, I'm getting all excited. I see my eyes glittering, so I'm going to calm down. Uh, e. coli is pretty sensitive to attack by Della Vibrio and biofilms. As I mentioned, I got excited. Now, what's interesting here is when people grow a biofilm of E. coli, they're generally using lab rat strains of E. coli. And the type of architecture that you see for E. coli biofilms is relatively simple. If you look, for example, at the way that Pseudomonas aeruginosa makes a biofilm, it's quite complex, as it should be, right? You've probably seen these mushroom-like effects, for example. And that's because, as I tell my students, you adhere to a surface, and then the food comes by. You don't have to hunt the food. So in any event, we knew this about E. coli. I've done the experiments. A lot of other people have. And the problem with studying biofilms in general is that we look at one thing at a time. We're innately a reductionist. And this is not how biofilms exist in nature. So then people will move to two or three members. And I applaud that, but it doesn't reflect nature. 
So I think that getting really detailed about how you're studying with the right equipment, as the authors do in this paper, is extremely important. Now, it so happens that Vibrio cholera is fairly resistant to attack by Della Vibrio in biofilms under the system they're using. They, they have these lovely microfluidic systems that they've set up. And they use this expression that the biofilms that Vibrio cholera forms under their conditions, they called them ordered. And I want everyone to think of them as castle walls because that will help you. It, it will, okay? Made of big stones that fit tightly together. Yep. Yeah. And, and so uh, it, it, and it looks pretty clear that some of the outer ones are a little bit resistant to attack, but the ones inside are very resistant. And this is because biofilms put down usually a very complicated glue, the, the series of adhesins that they put down. In some microbes, like in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, early on in particular, it's DNA of all things that glues them down. But it changes over time. And I think it's nutritionally dependent. And there's a lot of evidence to bring that up. So again, they have this system in a microfluidics setup with flow rates and all that good kind of stuff. So they can do kind of in vivo, confocal, laser microscopy, and beautiful pictures. First thing they had to do, and I love that they made a big deal about it rather than blow it off, is that Vibrio has a type, Vibrio cholerae has a type 6 secretory system, those molecular switchblade knives, and they will kill other bacteria. So the first thing they did wisely is knock that out. Now, if they hadn't done that and done this experiment, they would have had a lot of deaths that they couldn't have, have explained very well, which to me is fascinating. So they labeled everything with different chromophores so they could track them. I will say, Petra, and I bet your, your ears will perk up to this. They normalize at an OD of 1.0. That's not nature. No. But I understand what they're doing. Also, the length of experiment is generally 48 hours. And I would also say gently that 1.0 of Della Vibrio is very different than 1.0 of E. coli. I'm sorry. Well, if they're quartered this size and 1.0 of E. coli is 10 to the 7th, so it's 4 times 10 to the 7th, I guess. Yeah. I don't know how it scales. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. And I'm not important or famous, so we'll just let them do their work. Well, they maybe it doesn't matter because the question that they're asking is in these big communities. So I don't think it matters, right? Well, right, it, right. it doesn't. Well, actually it does, as you'll see at the end, which is exciting to me. And I can't wait to tell you about it. So I do want to say that this work is done in M9 media of all things. And I really do think that media is important to this. When I teach students about biofilms using Pseudomonas putida, and we don't add glucose to the media, we never get good biofilms. And M9, for the audience, is a chemically defined medium in which you know the mole fraction of everything in the medium. It's also used for doing imaging where you're using uh, fluorescent dyes because the more complex mystery media like LB, which we've discussed, I think, a couple episodes ago, that one Oof. has a lot of internal autofluorescence in media, and it's not nice. It makes confocal next to impossible to accomplish. So what it looks like is that when you add them together and look who settles on their glass slide, because that's really what they're looking at, you see these kind of 10 to 90 relationships between E. coli and Vibrio, 90% Vibrio, 10% E. coli. We're going to come back to that. Uh, but I do want to remind everybody that if you stew this with just Vibrio or just E. coli, let it settle for a few hours to start to form the biofilms. Then you add the predators, the Della Vibrio. Uh, Vibrio is pretty darn resistant, but E. coli gets slaughtered. Yeah, and that's that's shown very clearly in their figure 1A. Mm -hmm. Isn't it pretty? And, and wh what I like, especially in some of these pictures, and it's more two-way, which we'll get to in a minute, is you can actually see what I call the hitchhiker effect. And the reason that E. coli, in, when they do a mixed culture, and, and they see two things that were really confusing to them, that Vibrio gets a little bit more sensitive, but E. coli becomes pretty resistant. Now, that's in these ordered castles. 
And in the ordered castle, like you see in uh, 2A, you can see the E. coli within the ordered structure of the Vibrio uh, colony, I should say, or micro colony. Can I call it a colony on, on in a microfluidics chamber? It looks yeah, pretty big. You can, it, it is. It's a, it's a group of organisms living together. So I think that would be a colony. An oh, adherent community. <laughs> It's a community. <laughs> I don't know where the cutoff is for micro colonies, so you should call it what you like. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thanks. So in any event, this is a weird reversal. I mean, I mean, Vibrio loses a little bit of what's going on, its protection, and E. coli gains some protection. And everything apparently is because of the way that Vibrio tends to form uh, their micro colonies in that they form what they call an ordered structure. I call it the castle walls. And what a, a E. coli is becoming more resistant because it's actually inhabiting some of those castles. Now, I know that sounds flippant, but it's a good way to look at it. And if you're looking at the paper, E. coli's color is yellow. Yes. Vibrio is red, and the Della Vibrio is the cyan. So if you look at the confocal imagery, you sort of give an overview of what's actually going. And Mark's showing us the picture now. You get an overview of what's going on. Isn't that beautiful? It is indeed, Mark. What it looks like is a, a colony of a whole bunch of red dots, which are the Vibrio, and the yellow are the E. coli. And there aren't very many of them. And they look like they're trying to hide, kind of snuggle into the Vibrio to hide from from the Adela Vibrio. They're trying to get into the brick wall. Exactly. They're trying to break Sneak in. Away. Okay, I'm too excited. But isn't that cool to see that so nicely? You would never see this by any other technique that they're talking about. And I, I want to call it something like hitchhiking, but that's not exactly true. To their credit, we not only get the beautiful images, but they also are able to quantify the fluorescence and apply various mm -hmm. um, mathematical equations to describe the uh, relationships. Yes, and remember, Della Vibrio do not have eyes, so they cannot see. And I think E. coli and Vibrio, even though they're not technically the same shape, they're about the same size. So are they just trying to hide in plain sight, so to speak? I don't know. <laughs> what are the E. coli trying thinking? Well, I, 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 it's, it's actually selection. Yeah. They, they, are, they are surviving. They're surviving. Yeah, exactly. So I, I do want to note, sorry, Mark, um, this is actually a good point. So this image actually, I think, is is the memorable moment in the lab. So the first author of this paper, Ben Wooker, he says that getting this to work, to see this beautiful image was very difficult. And it takes two and a half days to get to the stage of this beautiful colony in figure two. And it required constant use of the microscope, which I'm sure was, uh, yeah, it took some negotiating with the other members of the lab. But um, the first time <laughs> he saw it, he said, it felt like running downstairs on Christmas morning to find that Santa had left you exactly what you have been asking for all year. <laughs> and I have to say, this is a beautiful picture. I hope he framed it because it is a great gift for Christmas or other birthdays, whatever. <laughs> and in figure four, he, he shows us some uh, the time series from nine hours through the 48 hours. And, yeah. and they really learned some cool things, which I'm sure Mark <laughs> will describe. Yeah. Uh, and I'm watching the time again, and I'm getting excited. I'm sorry. But this is the emergent properties business that I talked about with, with everybody. The weakening effect on, on Vibrio, kind of hard to explain, but they've got some ideas. And it has to do with two different ways that Fibrio forms their, their protective colony in concert with E. coli. And they do, in one case, they have this, and they call them ordered. And the ordered situation, you have some E. coli hiding out inside, and they're pretty well protected, right? And the Vibrios are protected inside. I presume the outer cells are, are in a lot of trouble. But what's interesting is you also get these homogeneously mixed biofilms, where you don't see what you saw in figure two. It looks like more of a, just a combination. And, and they get, they get chomped on very easily. I hate to be flippant with chomped on, but they, that's what it looks like. It has to do with input numbers, which is something I can't wait to hear Michelle talk about. If you have a low input to begin with, 
it looks as if you get that ordered microcolony shape that is protective of E. coli and of the Vibrio. However, if you have large numbers of cells going in, you get these disordered biofilms that are very sensitive to predation of both members. Would that sound about accurate, Michelle? Yeah, and they actually were very specific. They measured the distance between cells when they added at low dilution and then the dis- average distance when they added at high uh, concentration and found strikingly different um, impacts on the structure of the biofilm that formed and the vulnerability then of the E. coli. One of the good things is folks have spent some time figuring out how the matrix is, I know, Keanu Reeves reference, the, they spent <laughs> some time with, with figuring out how the matrix of Vibrios work And they actually did some flag tagging of some of the members. And one thing that they note is that RMBC, one of the proteins that's important for this, seems to congregate around E. coli, though it's made by Vibrio. And this may be related to this disrupted, disrupted, disordered biofilm that you see. I I forgot to mention a little bit earlier they wondered if this was Della Vibrio specific, and they actually tested whether E. coli was protected against T7 phage and lambda, and it was. So it, it is apparently something where they're just the protective aspect is going on. And only when they're embedded, surrounded by the um, bricks or stones of the uh, yes, Vibrio. Yes, exactly so. You, you know, this reminds me very much, I, I don't know if you've seen the paper, but it's lovely how bacillus reacts to mixo, mixobacters. And they'll form these, and I'm going to call them castles, these large sporulating structures that are resistant to attack by mixobacters. And we tend to be reductionists. We looked at one cell type at a time, or we look at this one and that one together. And this is a great example of how two different organisms can interact to fight or defend against a third. It's a public goods situation, of course, and you would expect to see cheating. And I'm sure as they continue, they'll see that. But it's it just is a wonderful example of sociomicrobiology that I just love. And figure five has got just some really dramatic illustrations of the difference. Um, if you're if you plate at a low density so that the um, vibrios can form their ordered colonies. They are totally resistant, or quite resistant to the um, predator. But yeah. if they played at high density, where the E. coli can get in, perhaps sheep and wolf's clothing with the yeah. vibrio protein stuck to their surface, now vibrio doesn't form these ordered structures. And guess what? They get chomped up and infected and killed by the predator. And this is super important because of what Michael had said, and we've all agreed that there are a number of diseases caused by biofilms. And we could also talk about the role that biofilms have in pretty much everything that we do, including our teeth. And if you wanted to use a living antibiotic (laughs) like Della Vibrio, all of this is relevant. And that's why I put some review papers up for people who were interested from Liz Socket and a couple of videos if anyone's interested. Before you put this on your teeth, know that the things that cause cavities are gram positive and not, as far as I know, yes, yes. to tell if <laughs> yes. But the things that cause periodontitis are gram negative. negatives. So you don't want those either. <laughs> no, and, 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 there's, and this comes back again. Petra, your, your point is very well taken, uh, but I do wonder about disruptions of communities. Um, mm mm-hmm. I have said many times, if you think you're going to use Della Vibrio or like organisms, as they're called, Balos, um, Laura Williams at Providence College does wonderful work, by the way. Shout out to, to Laura. I don't see that as fundamentally different than using antibiotics because of the broad spectrum aspect. And we really don't know what the receptor truly is. Uh, There are a number of papers from the 70s that I make my students read and we laugh about them. This aspect of the outer membrane is not involved with predation. That one is not involved with predation. That one is not involved with predation. It's really hard to figure out, as I've mentioned. So let me ask you this, Mark. What if you had Klebsiella, which is E. coli with a capsule? Not quite, Michael, not quite. (laughs) Well, sort of. Sort if you had of. Shigella, maybe that's a better, closer. Oh. Shigella with a big capsule. I adore all of you. Good Lord. 
<laughs> I'm standing up for Klebsiella. It's its own. You should it's stand, its own bacteria. Stand, stand up for Klebsiella. <laughs> you should. So, what's your question, Michael? What would capsules actually prevent E. coli from suffering from della Vibrio no. predation? No, they slice right through capsules. That work was done by Suzanne Koval in the 1970s. It's it's really wonderful work. But as we're almost out of time, I did want to say one thing that concerns me. And when I say this, this has been such hard work, wonderful work, work I could never do. But there's something that most people don't know, and I do, and I want to share it with you. When Sid Rittenberg started working with 109J, which is everyone's source of 109J, he was passaging it on E. coli, specifically a strain called ML35, and he was doing that once a week for well over 20 years before it got frozen away by ATCC. Now, I already mentioned how the dead hand of Darwin is on all that lives. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons people moved to the other type strain, which is called HD100, is because it had not been cultivated in that fashion, right? So I would love to see them confirm this with HD100. I used to do a lot of work with 109J, so I'm not negative about it. It's just an interesting choice. And because you've selected it against – you selected it for its ability to grow on E. coli. Yes. Yeah, that's, but that's as an my experimentalist, cons- I would argue they chose a great strain of Della Vibrio Bri- because <laughs> what they want is a tool to ask yes. about the architecture of these biofilms, and it's perfectly suitable for that question. Uh, oh, oh, no. And I've got to tell you, I had guessed and guessed and guessed about what a mixed – culture, a mixed colony would look like in response. And they showed me with that figure, which I want in a t-shirt. That's how much <laughs> I like that picture. It is okay? beautiful. To go back to like whether the lab strain versus the more recent isolate, I learned actually at a meeting last week from Tobias Dorr, who works on Vibrio cholera, the outer membrane of Vibrio cholera and some other gram negatives is much more sturdy, I guess, than E. coli's. And in fact, you can get rid of Vibrio's cell wall. He works on the lytic transglycosylases and the Vibrio just round up, but they stay intact and they seem quite happy without a cell wall. So I'm also wondering whether how much, di- I know, right? <laughs> the different properties of these outer membranes might feed into the ability because Delo has to get through that. Yes. And, and there's been some wonderful work again. Um, people associated with Liz Socket, a, a name I cannot recall who did some wonderful work on it. I, Andy Loveling, that's his name. I got it. Um, which is wonderful. But the other thing to consider is that I don't know how often Vibrio cholera and E. coli would be together. And I'm wondering about co-cultures over time. Because for, mm. for example, and this is a lovely, lovely experiment. I, it's, it's very seldom that I read a paper and then I'm saying, well, did they do X as I'm reading it? And then the next paragraph, they do X, which I really liked. And the question was, could E. coli invade one of these castle walls after they formed or one of these ordered colonies? I'll be more formal. They tried that and E. coli can't get in. And that's really interesting to me. So I wonder if they are co-cultured over a period of time, especially if they have this as a driving selective force, if you could create uh, an association between Vibrio cholera and E. coli. They would team Evolution. Up. Yeah. Tell us more about this research group, Petra. Yes. Yeah, so this is Carrie Nadell's research group at Dartmouth. And the first author on this paper, says that he started uh, at a very young age to be interested in science. So just by going to the local creek, the zoo, and the Natural History Museum gave him an appreciation for the diversity of biology and the clever ways organisms exist in their environment. He distinctly remembers eagerly awaiting the weekly episode releases of the original planet Earth, like it was the latest episode of Game Mm -hmm. of Thrones. (laughs) (laughs) Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. A PG version. Um, Ben's interest in microbes came during his undergraduate years at the University of Rochester, which has wonderful microbiology. As a declared ecology and evolution major, his first semester included molecular and cellular biology. There he got his first introduction to the sheer diversity of the microbial world. That's wonderful that they have that in their intro course. How they yeah. managed to survive in ways he didn't know existed, whether on the back of his hand or in the hottest spring in Yellowstone. Within the week, he had shifted to 
into pursuing a degree in microbiology and immunology. Even when engrossed in the molecular aspects of biology, Ben always thinks of himself as a field biologist at heart. It's like you're Mm -hmm. in a teeny tiny field (laughs) with controlled temperature and no insects. (laughs) Turning over (laughs) stones in a creek and turning over the focus, turning the focus of a microscope provide the same delight. It's true, actually. This is a great image of this, of seeing what fascinating behaviors unseen organisms have to show us. Um, and as a graduate student at Dartmouth, Ben discovered Carrie Nadell's lab to be the most spectacular space. The advice and support he received from lab mates permeated all aspects of his work there. Ideas and motivations for experiments, troubleshooting, and analysis would not have been possible without the encouragement of his lab mates and his doctoral advisor, Carrie. It's a wonderful shout out for his advisor as a trainer. Um, I do like his advice for other students. I think it's it's really great because he's as he says he's someone who's struggled with imposter syndrome. The advice he would give would be to learn lean on your community and ask for help. So often there's a narrative push that science is a solo effort that can feel really isolating. When in reality, the best science is achieved via collaboration and inclusive efforts. And importantly, asking for help from your peers and others in your field get you past issues you're having in the lab. But it really shows you that we all face the same kinds of problems. And I think this is, you know, people will present data and you think they just got there magically and they're somehow (laughs) superior in some way, but everybody has the same problems. And that's something he wishes he figured out years before it clicked. And then Ben is also um, says he'll forever be grateful to his parents for instilling curiosity yeah. as a virtue. And yes, obviously that's something sweet. that every scientist uh, d- drives mm. us all, curiosity. Thank you for that, Mark. You're welcome. Are you still excited? Every day. <laughs> when, you know, I, I, love the, I love the weird ones. That's what it is. I always have. All right. Well, it's it's painstaking work, and they did it beautifully, showing us the images and then also the quantitative biology to, to back up their uh, conclusions. The quantitation is, is very beautiful. It may not be as uh, you want to put it in a picture on your wall, but it is uh, very <laughs> nice images. For I've got this understand. on my desk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Looks like a coffee filter. <laughs> no, it's it's a 3D print of a bacillus colony. It's a 3D so print want- of a biofilm for me, Bacillus <laughs> Colony. <laughs> Looks like a sand dollar, Mark. So if you'd like to see these beautiful images that we're talking about and the quantitative data behind it, um, this was published in PNAS um, in mm. uh, November. November. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's behind a paywall. So mm-hmm. I also have a nice twim thing that Mark gave me. I don't think if you can see it because it can't focus. If I move it closer, you wouldn't see it. But it says twim. And it glows in the dark. As all things right. should. Uh, nice. That's that's from Mark and, and your wife, Jenny, right? She, that's she right. printed this? Yeah, she's the smart one. We got this when we were out in uh, San Diego. San Diego, yeah. right? I've got one too. Yep. Yes. And so does Alio. That's correct. That is TWIM282. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIM. Questions, comments, twim at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, we would like to have your financial support. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. The parent company of Twim Microbe TV is a nonprofit, 5013C. So your donations are U.S. federal tax deductible. Mark Martin, University of Puget Sound. Thanks for coming back, Mark. You're welcome. Twim adjacent, adjacent, tough word to say. Michelle Swanson, University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Michael Schmidt, Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And Petra Levin, Washington University, St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Thank you, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.